our president, Bruce Dumbach. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Glad to see everybody here. We have a pretty nice turnout. I was hoping for a little bit more. I'm not speaking loud enough. Okay, Robert. <laughs> the speaker this evening is Dominic Marie Miller. And she'll be discussing women at war, which uh, a lot of people probably didn't know women actually took, took up arms and fought alongside the men. They did it in the Revolutionary War, Civil War, and of course today, they do it all the time. They're part of, they're part of the combat forces. So, uh, uh, Ms. Miller is a Third Circuit Court of Appeals librarian for the Middle District of Pennsylvania and the founder of the Preserving, Preserving the History of Newburytown. And she has written two cookbooks. I don't know if you brought any with you tonight. No, but you can get them online. Okay. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to you. Thank you. I'm live streaming to Facebook, so I'm just going to move this up a little bit. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Like you said, I'm Domina Schmiller. Um, I'm actually a reenactor with the 87th Pennsylvania, um, and I portray a private. So when I joined, I thought that women in the Civil War was a good topic to learn about, being a woman portraying someone in the Civil War. And the more I looked into it, the more people didn't really think that it happened. And we have factual proof that it did. So without further ado. So um, contrary to popular belief, women did in fact fight in the American Civil War. Um, they infiltrated the United States Army in earlier wars as well. Um, Deborah Sampson is probably one of the most famous women that infiltrated the Army. Um, she served for 17 months in the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War as Robert uh, Shirtliff. And um, Lucy Brewer served with the Marines aboard Old Ironsides as George Baker during the War of 1812. Uh, once a taboo topic, modern historians are finally shedding light on the role that female soldiers played in the Civil War and the women who made a living off of lying about their military service. Because you'll find out through history that even though some women didn't become soldiers during the Civil War, they wrote books and tried to make it seem like they did because it was a great way to make money and a name for yourself. So we're going to start with reasons women joined the fight. So a lot of women were left behind during the war. Um, entire towns would be recruited for the army and they'd go to war. And especially in an agricultural society, women were left at home to fend for themselves. They had to raise the kids, they had to take care of the farm. Um, so a lot of the women, if they were able to, would follow their husbands to the war. So then they also just had some really adventurous women that decided that they wanted to try their hand at being a soldier. Um, reliable wages was a major reason that women would go off to fight. So the average Union soldier would make about $13 a month and the average Confederate soldier would make about $11 a month. And during the Civil War, having a reliable wage was a big draw. So if you're at home and your only wages are going to come from the crops um, on your farm and an army might come through and decimate that and you're not guaranteed your wages, you're not guaranteed your money, um, you're not guaranteed food, water, or shelter, joining the army might really be a good draw because you're guaranteed uh, your wages, you're going to be guaranteed the food that they ration you, and you're going to have a place to sleep, even if it's just a dog tent. Um, so when you look through the resources available about women in the Civil War, you're going to find some different numbers. So the American Battlefield Trust says that about 400 to 750 women fought during the Civil War. So that's a pretty conservative number in my mind. And we know that women definitely did fight because after the Battle of Gettysburg, a female Confederate was found dead near Cemetery Ridge. So we know that at least one woman Confederate soldier was found in Gettysburg, and I believe there's between three to five female Union soldiers that have been found in Gettysburg. Then the Washington Post says between 400 and 1,000 women fought. So there you're going even higher. And then the Smithsonian says about 400 women. So I think we can all agree that at least 
400 women have fought in the Civil War, and then PBS, um, their lower limit is 1,000. So really depending on what book you read, um, what website you go to, what articles you're gonna read, the number's gonna vary because we just don't know. If you were a woman during the Civil War and you were doing your job right, you were never found out, and that was the whole goal. So how did women disguise themselves? So this is a picture of me smoking a cigar. <laughs> so um, most of the people that fought during the Civil War were citizen soldiers. So these weren't a trained militia. You're not um, gonna have a soldier who made a career out of it. Um, although there were many men that did that, there were also just men recruited straight from the farm. So something that you're gonna have to take into consideration is a lot of these men had no formal military training. So it was not that difficult for a woman who didn't have any military training to sort of pass off the fact that they didn't know what they were doing um, by the fact that they were just recruited off the farm or recruited out of town. Um, and then you're gonna have the fact that medical examinations did not require you to remove your clothing. You had to have enough teeth to rip a cartridge open. So they always say two teeth over two teeth was enough to get you into the army. You had to rip open your cartridge. Um, I just recently read an article that said that might be a little bit of a myth. They probably wanted you to have more than four teeth in your whole head, but you had to have at least four. Um, and then you had to have a trigger finger. So could you pull the trigger on your rifle? If you could do that, if you could walk, if you could march, you were good enough for military service. So you're thinking of a woman coming in, they're pretending to be a man, they're probably dressed as a man, probably walking and talking like a man. They're not gonna ask her for a physical exam, she's not gonna have to take her shirt off. There's no way that they're going to look close enough probably to realize that that's a female. Uh, women cut their hair short and they bound their breasts flat. So if you were a woman that was younger, um, again from an agricultural society, that you didn't have a lot of food, you were working very hard, low body fat, um, breast tissue is fat. So they probably didn't have to hide very much breast tissue. Um, and again, you could get by by just wearing baggy clothing, binding the breasts and cutting your hair short. Um, in the Victorian society, women had long hair. They wore it up and they usually wore bonnets. But if you were walking into a recruiting office and you have a really shaggy, cut hair, they're not going to think that you're a woman because ideals at the time said women had long hair that they kept clean, they kept it up in a bonnet or under a rag. Um, most soldiers at the time, they slept fully clothed. If you're thinking about it, you're out sleeping on the ground, probably under a dog tent or just under the stars. You're not gonna strip down to just your underwear. It's gonna be cold, you're out in the elements, you're probably wearing your coat to keep yourself warm. Um, you probably have your blanket on, so that's another way to disguise yourself. Um, and then women usually avoided public latrines, obviously. <laughs> um, so again, you're out in the open, you're marching, you're with other soldiers, so it's probably not that far-fetched to think that you could walk off behind a bush somewhere or go into the woods and um, relieve yourself and go to the bathroom where you're not being watched, so people aren't going to find out that way either. Um, and then you could go months without fully bathing. So think of what I call like a little cat bath. So you're just gonna, you know, go down to the river, you're gonna wash your face, maybe. Um, you know, you could just pull up your shirt sleeves, wash the dirt off your hands. You don't have to get fully naked to bathe yourself if you're a Civil War soldier. Um, now, plenty of people did. Soldiers did walk around without their shirts off sometimes. Um, they unbuttoned their shirts. They weren't fully clothed all the time. But if you're a woman and you're keeping to yourself, which honestly is the best disguise. Just keep to yourself. Don't draw a lot of attention to yourself. Um, that's probably the easiest way to get by without being recognized as a female. Um, and then continued, how do women disguise themselves? Um, a lot of women, when they entered military service because of the fact that you're marching 25 miles a day, you're carrying a rifle, you're carrying a heavy pack, um, you're going to lose your menstrual cycle. So think about elite athletes today, uh, female gymnasts, for example. They get to a point where their body fat is so low that they lose their menstrual cycle. So that's another reason that a lot of women in military service weren't found out. They don't have a balanced diet like we have today. They're probably not getting enough water. Um, you know, they're probably getting diseases that we wouldn't have. Think about dysentery, cholera. So you're going to lose your natural menstrual cycle. So you're not going to have to worry about that. 
Um, but if you did maintain your menstrual cycle, you can use, again, like today they didn't have tampons, they didn't have the pads with the cotton. So you were gonna use a rag or um, like a piece of cotton fabric. And you can just say, oh, I cut myself, that's what that dirty rag is from. Or, you know, we're at war, there's going to be blood, there's going to be other things that are dirty and bloody. So you can play that off. It's not necessarily like, oh no, there's a woman amongst us. There's a way that you can play that off. Um, the average Civil War uniform, so they call it a sack coat. So that should tell you right there that it's not form fitting. You're gonna have on long underwear. You're gonna have on a long overshirt. You're gonna have on a sack coat. So if you're a woman, if you're low in body fat, your, bre your uh, breasts are bound, and then you have on all those layers, you're not going to have a womanly figure like you think of the average woman during the Civil War. Um, you know, the higher class women, they were wearing corsets. They were wearing a tight fitting dress. They were wearing bonnets. They were wearing gloves. Um, women that were working on the farms, they probably did have their skin tanned from being outside. They probably had callous tans from working on the farms. So it's not that far-fetched to think that a woman could pass as a man in those instances. Um, they didn't have the beautiful lily white hands that were always covered by a glove. That would give you away right away. Um, but a woman that's used to working outside, used to being in the sun, used to hard work, um, just by wearing the non-form-fitting clothing, having her hair cut short, being lower in body fat, that could help her pass. Um, and then you had to take into consideration that the average male Civil War soldier was a younger guy. So if you're an 18, 19 year old new recruit, you're probably not even growing peach fuzz yet. Um, so obviously a woman that has soft skin, no facial hair, it's not that surprising that she might look like a younger um, more feminine man that probably hasn't fully gone through puberty yet. Um, so a young male soldier probably looked a lot like a female soldier trying to pass as a man. Um, females would have to adopt um, a lot of the typical mannerisms. So here's me with another cigar. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, men's behavior back then really differed from what a lady was at the time. Um, a lady would be sitting in her parlor doing needlework, um, drinking tea or something like that, and a man, a soldier, would be swearing, he'd be spitting, chewing tobacco, cigars, playing cards. You'd never see a lady caught dead playing cards. Um, so if you wanna fit in and you don't wanna draw attention to yourself, what's the best way to do that? You gotta start acting like a man. You gotta walk the walk, you gotta talk the talk. And then due to the Victorian ideals at the time, you're not going to really think of a woman, especially off the farm, walking around in trousers, walking around without that corseted look, without a dress. So just the fact that women would dare to cut their hair short and dress like a man, I'm sure a lot of men at the time, it didn't even come into their conscience that, oh my gosh, here is a woman who's essentially cross-dressing. Here's a woman putting her life at risk, willing to be killed, um, willing to act like a man and spit and play cards and swear. Um, that's something that probably didn't even come into their minds. So that was just an easy way to pass as well because if it's the last thing people were thinking about, then you really don't have anything to worry about. I'm sure there was some talk in camp about um, men being a little too feminine or, oh, that guy, you know, he doesn't even have a beard yet. He can't grow a mustache, but it could have been a woman. So that was a good way for them to pass as well. And then how were they discovered? This is a picture of me after I was found out to be an imposter um, and they put me on trial. So um, with the 87th PA, we like to do a little court martial when we have living history events. So the gist of it is I usually am injured. Um, I'm hit by shrapnel or I'm shot. And because of that, I have to go to the field hospital. And when they open up my sack coat, what do they find? Breasts, I'm a woman, oh no, you know. So I'm marked as an imposter. And back then, that's usually how you were found out. A lot of women were found out when they were wounded. If you had to go to the field hospital and have your leg amputated, what are they gonna do? They're gonna take your trousers off. You're going to have different parts than a man. That's how they're gonna find out. You're hitting the shoulder, your arm, your chest. They're gonna have to open up your sack coat and they're gonna find things different than a man. Or, you know, like the woman at Gettysburg near Cemetery Ridge, a lot of women just died in battle and they weren't found out until they were ready to be buried. 
Um, and then some women did actually give birth while in the Civil War. If you're thinking about it, if you're at such a low body fat, if your entire way of life is flipped upside down, you're not getting the right nutrition, it is possible that you could be pregnant and not show like the average woman. So there was a story of a woman that was on picket duty when she went into labor. <laughs> and the unit wrote home that she gave birth to a baby boy, and I believe they named it Johnny, <laughs> and they sent her packing. Um, <laughs> she didn't get a pension, the baby didn't get one either. Um, and then the cases of uh, women were just too womanly. There was a story where someone went to lob an apple and the woman went to grab her apron to catch the apple, and that gave her away. Um, and then there were some women who probably forgot where they were for a second and were a little too infeminate. Um, you know, they weren't spitting, they weren't cussing, they weren't smoking that cigar, um, so it gave them away. But um, if they were found out, like I usually am, every reenactment that we do, <laughs> um, there's different things that would happen to you. So they send some women just pack in straight away. Go home, go back to your family. It's shameful for you to be here. Why are you here? Go home. Um, and then some women were sent to the prison camp. You know, you weren't meant to be here. You infiltrated the United States Army. That's a crime. You shouldn't be here. Um, some women just deserted. So if they were caught, then they'd be brought up on charges of desertion. And then there was women that were sent to prison or um, mental institutions. So. You have to be crazy if you're willing to cut your hair to move away from your family, to put your life at risk and infiltrate the United States Army. So you deserve to go to an insane asylum for the rest of your life. So those are certain things that happen. Usually uh, during my court martial, uh, my cousin's here with me, he's a reenactor as well, and um, he usually tries to get me off. I'm innocent, I always say I'm innocent, even if I am an imposter. Um, but a few times I've been uh, sentenced to death, but usually they just send me home. So that's nice, because you have to remember, women weren't on a jury back then. It was all men, especially at a court martial. So we like to pick a few men out of the crowd, and then usually the women in the crowd shame them, if it's anything but sending me home. And I think once or twice I've, I've been able to stay because I'm a good soldier. So. so here is one of our first women that I'd like to highlight tonight. Um, so this is Sarah Emma Edmonds Seeley, and she was known as Franklin Flint Thompson of the 2nd Michigan Infantry. And I wanted to highlight her tonight because we know for a fact that she was a female soldier in the American Civil War. And we know this because she wrote letters home. And it wasn't until she deserted from the army and left the army and her family and her applied for this pension and proved that she was indeed a soldier, that she was the first and only woman to draw a pension from the United States Army during the Civil War. So we know for a fact that she was in fact in the army and they ended up clearing her of those desertion charges. Um, she ended up writing a book and that book was called Nurse and Spy in the Union Army and the first edition was released in 1864. Um, she was admitted into the Grand Army of the Republic and she was the only female member and that was in 1897. Um, and then in 1901 she was reburied with military honors at the Washington Cemetery in Houston. So there's plenty of women that I could talk about that were soldiers um, but then we also have to highlight the fact that a lot of women lied about their military service. Um, once word of the fact that women were making money and writing books about their military service, there were some copycats. And it's all the way to today, we're still finding historians are looking and um, finding cases of women who had a tin type taken of them in uniform and, you know, they look pretty manly and they wrote a book about it. And then you find out that those letters they wrote at home were forged and their family was in on it and they sold a lot of copies of books and it's just not true. Another one um, was Sarah Rosetta Wakeman, and she went by Private Lyons Wakeman of the 153rd New York Infantry. And this is a really rare case of, they didn't find out that she was a female soldier until she was already buried. So her family came forward with the letters that she had written. 
And then when they exhumed the body, they realized, oh my goodness, she really was a female soldier in the United States Army. So on May 3rd, Wakeman reported to the regimental hospital suffering from chronic diarrhea. She was transferred to a hospital in New Orleans, arriving there on May 22nd. By this time, she was gravely ill, and on June 19th, 1864, she died. There is no record of her true sex ever having been discovered, and she was buried under the name Private Lyons Wakeman at Chalamet National Cemetery near New Orleans. In one of her letters home, she had written, I don't know how long before I shall have to go into the field for battle. For my part, I don't care, and I don't feel afraid to go. So this article was written by the American Battlefield Trust, and it really highlights her bravery and the fact that she was very patriotic and she was willing to go out there and risk her life for her country. And she, again, wasn't found out until after she died. And so there's a, a woman who was just doing it um, for her own reason. She wasn't looking for fame. She wasn't looking for fortune. Uh, and who knows, she could have been the second woman to get a pension if she could have lived long enough, but we'll never know. Um, besides soldiers, we had what we called vivionaires. So that's a French term. So these were women that would attend, attach themselves to regiments. And they were um, a step above a camp follower. So they were paid by the regiment, usually to carry water or to carry whiskey. Um, and this um, started during the Crimean War, and then it became a thing in the American Civil War. So we have um, Marie Tepe, Fearless French Mary. So she was the most famous of them. And uh, she followed her husband into war and enlisted in the 27th Pennsylvania Infantry, and she worked in the regimental hospital sold goods, and carried a one-and-a-half-gallon keg of whiskey or water for the regiment. Now, these women usually had a modified uniform that they would wear. Um, they'd have a sack coat, they'd have a belt, they'd have breeches, and then they'd put a skirt over top of it. And a lot of them carried pistols because they had to protect themselves. Um, if a wounded soldier would fall and they're laying there waiting for medical attention, she would bring water or whiskey out to them. And the battle's not stopping just because someone got wounded. So she had to be able to protect herself. And since she was making money, she had to be able to protect the income that she had. Um, because she actually, um, someone stole all of her money when she was with this regiment. So she ended up moving to another regiment. Um, she then um, was with the 114th Pennsylvania Zouaves. And she worked as a settler, a cook, a washwoman, and she sewed for the regiment. She received a soldier's pay with an additional 25 cents for each day spent working at the regimental hospital, and she was awarded the Kearney Cross. So she is a wonderful woman that, although was not a soldier, was pretty much um, just as patriotic and willing to help. And the 87th PA, which I um, reenact with, we usually have a woman named Kathy that um, does her own rendition of a Vionaire. And um, she's not really reenacting with us anymore, but when she does come out into the field, it's really cool to see her outfit. It's, she looks just like Marie Tepe. And then there's other women um, that, again, not soldiers, but just as important. So Harriet Tubman, she was a former slave, but she was also a conductor on the Underground Railroad. And I am the founder of Preserving the History of Newburytown, and she actually visited Newburytown on her Underground Railroad. Um, there was a farm in town, uh, the Baptist farm, and it was an African-American couple that um, helped enslaved people escape to the north, and she visited that farm. Uh, she was also a Union cook and nurse, and she was a Union spy. So women made great spies during the Civil War because just like being a female soldier, they're not going to expect a woman to be a spy. And then they're not going to expect an African-American woman to be a spy either. So Tubman became the first woman in the country's history to lead a military expedition when she helped Colonel James Montgomery plan a night raid to free slaves from rice plantations along the Combahee <coughs> River. And that's from the Smithsonian Magazine. So these women, again, not necessarily soldiers, but playing just as important of a role. And that brings us to a famous Confederate spy, because we don't want to leave the Confederates out of this. Uh, Maria Isabella Bell Boyd, and I'm sure a lot of you, if you're history buffs, especially Civil War buffs, know who Bell Boyd is. So she was a Confederate spy. Um, the Union Army and the press dubbed her La Belle Rebel, Siren of the Shenandoah, or the Rebel Joan of Arc. And then she was the author of a book because, again, women had to make money somehow, so they usually wrote a book about it. 
And that was Belle Boy in Camp in Prison, published in 1865 because she was captured and spent some time in prison, in a Civil War prison camp. Um, she took her shell on the road, and after the Civil War was over, and after she was freed from camp and prison, she became an actress and a lecturer, spending a lot of time in London, and her show was called The Perils of a Spy. Um, so a lot of women, they uh, were mothers, they were wives, and a great way to be a spy during the Civil War was to take your child with you. So if you have a little girl on your hip who maybe has a baby doll, you unscrew the top of the baby doll's head and you put the note in the baby doll's head, screw it back on, bring your little girl with you, they're going to whisk you right by. They're not looking for your daughter to have the material that, uh, you know, is going to help the Confederacy. Um, so women and children made great spies during the Civil War. Then we have camp followers. So camp followers were usually the wives and children that followed the camp. So they served a pivotal role because they were the ones that were cooking. They were the ones that were washing the uniforms. They were sewing the uniforms for the men and just keeping the morale up in camp. So this was another major role that women played during the Civil War. So they were credited with boosting the morale because these men missed their families. A lot of these men had never been a more than a few miles away from home. And then they're marching across the whole country. And to have their wives and to have their children follow them was a big boost. And a lot of these men, you've just marched 25 miles, you just survived a battle, the last thing you wanna do is darn your socks. So having women around to be able to do those things for you was a huge boost. And then lastly, we have the sex workers of the Civil War. So in 1864, there were approximately 450 brothels in D.C. and 75 brothels in Alexandria, Virginia. And in D.C. alone, there was about 5,000 hookers. So a lot of people think that prostitutes or hookers got that term from General Hooker. But that's just an old wives' tale. Uh, hookers were around and being called that um, since approximately 1845. Uh, but the reason people think that they got the name Hookers is because General Hooker came to town and he came to DC and where he set up camp, the alleyway became, became Hooker's Alley, Hooker's Row. Um, and that's where the red light district of DC uh, sprung up. And the women that you know were doing sex work during the Civil War, they needed the financial support, they needed that income. Um, if they were single, they had to make money somehow. Um, industry, especially in the South, um, had changed a lot because of the war. These entire towns and neighborhoods were being destroyed. The men had left. So where do you go? You go where the men are, and the men are in camp. And what do they need? A boost of morale. <laughs> <laughs> and then in Nashville and Memphis, it was such a booming uh, industry that the government sanctioned prostitution and it became legal. And then um, <coughs> men in the Civil War could also, if you didn't want to go to a prostitute, you could buy um, erotic literature. They sold cards that had pornography on them. Um, and you could um, buy all of that through a mail-in subscription. And you could also just buy pictures of your favorite pinup girl. You know, just like World War II, they were putting up pinup girls. They had the Civil War version of that. Um, many soldiers complained, though, about the venereal diseases caught by prostitutes. And uh, venereal disease was especially rampant in the South because prostitution was legalized and a lot of the brothels and prostitutes, prostitutes were um, in D.C. or farther south. Uh, unfortunately for the Confederate soldiers, and hey, maybe it helped us win the war, a lot of them um, caught venereal disease. Um, for the later half of the 1800s, at least two major red light districts were right in the center of DC and even within sight of the White House. So I, I know it's hard to see, I couldn't get my projector to make it any bigger, but that's a map showing you um, where the red light district of DC was. Um, one of the most notorious of these was Hooker's Division, which we spoke about a few minutes ago, on the west end of the Federal Triangle and right on the National Mall. So if you think about D.C. today, could you imagine a brothel right at the National Mall? <laughs> so definitely a different time. Um, 
With the White House to the north and the Capitol to the east and the business district within walking distance, it was perfectly positioned. The area got its name during the Civil War when the Union General Hooker moved everything seedy into the Capitol. Um, <laughs> to a choice few spots and the division was one such place. The name also at least partially arose from how often Hooker's men visited the district. Hint, a lot. The Evening Star had this to say of Hooker's division in 1863. There are at present more houses of this character ill repute by 10 times in the city than has ever existed here before. And loose characters can now be counted by the thousands. And that's a quote from within inside of the White House, The Archaeology of Working Women. So that's a book about sex workers during the Civil War. Um, but just to end this, I just, again, want to highlight the fact that women played a pivotal role during the Civil War, whether that be contributions of being soldiers, um, staying home, taking care of the farm, taking care of the house, taking care of their children, um, following the soldiers, being camp followers, and helping boost morale, and even if that's through sex work, which, you know, is frowned upon, but you had to do what you had to do in desperate times, called for desperate measures, but um, we couldn't have won the Civil War without women and their contributions, so that's just what I want to leave you with tonight, so thank you. Are there any questions? Again, it's something that's not common. There's only really one documented case of a woman getting a pension oh. um, from the Civil War, and that was just because a lot of these women were actually very good soldiers. They had a great reputation in camp because people genuinely thought it was just a young man that was a good soldier. So when a woman did apply for a pension, and many did apply, um, again, only one case where it was actually granted to her. Um, but when they applied, a lot of the people had soldiers from their regiment right in and vouch for their character to say no uh, you know this woman who i thought was a man was very brave was always helping out in camp you know so they had people vouch for their character but no i mean the government wasn't going to throw money at someone who illegally joined the army so how much was a pension was that lifetime yeah yeah so i think the last um child of a Civil War soldier that was still collecting a pension just died in the last two years. Yeah, so that was a lifetime pension that you received. How much? I think it was, was it $8 a month? Mm -hmm. I think. It's like half, yeah. Yeah, like half it, was, it was like it half boosted your... The, the base pay to $16 and then you got half of that. Yeah, $8 a month. I think $8. Okay. With Randy, uh, is that right? Randy? That sounds about right. <laughs> Randy says that's about right, about eight dollars. You the only Randy's one here that actually fought in the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> Randy is still drawing his Civil War pension, <laughs> and, that, and that makes her happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, eight dollars. The families that followed. Yes. That's right. Did they cook for them? Yes. You're right. Who supplied the food? So they were cooking with rations. So either to supplement rations, you could go out and you could forage for food. You could steal from a farm. You could go hunting. There were a lot of ways that you could get food. Now, just because you could do that didn't mean it was always readily available. If another regiment came in before you and got to the farm first or hunted out the area, but they would use rations and then they would use whatever they found. And then sometimes they did, you know, if you came through a town on your way and you had enough money, you could buy some food to bring along. Thank you. Yeah. Randy. Well, since I was there. <laughs> first hand account. First hand account. <laughs> After Pickett's charge, the Union troops went out to see who was still alive from both sides. Uh -huh. And there were at least two female Confederates that participated in Pickett's charge. One was found near the high water mark, dead. Another one was captured, he was wounded. And the Union soldier who was recovering in a Union hospital, I believe he was in a New York regiment, wrote that there was a female secession 
in the bed near me or beside mm -hmm. me or whatever, and she's going to lose her leg. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there was at least two females that took a shot. Right. One wasn't that tall. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you.